everyone. Uh, welcome to Business Bites. Um, I hope everyone is having a really good Wednesday so far. You know, I'm really excited to see everyone joining us today uh, just for another great speaker discussion. So for those of you who may not know, my name is Kayla and I am with Hana House in Palo Alto. So if any of you are from the Bay Area or ever go into our Palo Alto location, please feel free to say hi. Um, and as a quick background, uh, Business Bites is a collaborative virtual series hosted by On Its Axis and Hana House. And if you're not familiar, On Its Access is an innovation consulting firm based in Southern California. And Hana House is a flexible co working space and cafe with locations in both Palo Alto and Newport Beach. And what's really cool about Hana House is that you know, our workspace is open to anyone that wants to use it. We have absolutely no membership costs or long term commitment. Instead, we offer uh, pay by the hour workspace reservations. So, you know, it's super flexible, really versatile, and it really can be used on an as needed basis, which is very unique in the co working world. And now today, I do encourage you all to use the chat feature at uh, the bottom to engage and really ask any questions throughout the session. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel and sent out via email. So, you know, maybe if you had a friend who can attend or, you know, if you have to leave the session early, uh, it'll be up on YouTube so you won't miss a thing. And with that, I would like to hand it back over to Davina. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Um, so today we have a really great session planned for you. Um, and what's really exciting is that we have our very own Kelly O'Connell, um, who I'll, I'll you know, give the opportunity to introduce herself, but she'll be leading today's session, um, really diving in into um, exceptional leadership and providing us with some strategies for um, how to lead an enduring company, whether you are currently doing so, have plans to do so. Um, Kelly will be able to um, provide some of that to us today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kelly to introduce herself and we'll we'll jump in. Well, thanks, Davina, and thanks to everyone attending live and to anybody listening in. As Davina shared, my name is Kelly O'Connell, and um, my career has uh, brought me to participating here on Business Bites. I started in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and had an opportunity to work uh, in the financial sector. From there, I went on to become an executive at one of the largest professional staffing and management consulting firms globally, where I had the opportunity to work with organizations, uh, large and small. So from what were small startups that are now unicorns and decacorns to some of the largest enduring Fortune 500s, uh, that have remained on that Fortune 500 list. Today I run uh, the People Division at On Its Axis. I am the interim CEO for Fairstream, which is a platform as a services company. And I'm a managing partner for a venture fund that's investing in early stage startups uh, that are building tech enabled solutions uh, to solve for historically under addressed problems in the world, uh, particularly in a few verticals. And so I bring all of that experience together to have uh, what should hopefully be a fun and informed conversation about what it takes to lead an enduring company. But first, my favorite fall activity. Um, I, I am uh, an East Coaster uh, by trade. Today, I split my time between the East and West Coasts, uh, but it doesn't feel like fall until a day out apple picking um, particularly apple picking when it's slightly cold and at the end I can have a warm apple cider and sit by a fire. So that's my favorite fall activity, um, harder to find in Southern California where I am today. Hopefully you all write in the chat what your favorite fall activity is. That's great. We do know that I believe next week is the first official day of fall, September 22nd. So um, that is, you know, exciting. It's definitely my favorite season. So I'm with Kelly on that one, being on the East Coast. That's certainly one of my favorite activities as well. Yes, uh, pumpkin donuts. Pumpkin donuts, yes. <laughs> I used apple cider donuts. I'm, I'm an apple cider girl. <clears throat> awesome. Well, thank you. Continue to, to um, keep sharing through chat. Would love to hear about some fall activities. Um, that you and your loved ones love to do, raking leaves and the smell of the air, perfect. Love that smell as well. 
raking leaves, not so much because that's <laughs> rigorous activity. <laughs> um, but I, I appreciate it. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump into the first question, Kelly, um, and we'll we'll keep moving through our questions. Um, and we will, as Kelly mentioned, we'll have time at the end for anyone in the call to ask questions either through chat or DMing Kelly or, or unmuting yourself, but we'll definitely have time at the end. Um, so our first question is, what is your definition of leadership? Well, there are many definitions of leadership, um, a leadership that uh, is a noun and leadership that's an action. And when I think about leadership, um, I shared that I was an East Coaster uh, by trade. I had the great opportunity to participate in a lot of community services programs. And one of those was participating in the Girl Scouts. And when I think of leadership, inevitably that, that early Girl Scout uh, mantra is, is what is the foundation for my understanding of leadership. It's this idea of being honest and fair, um, finding courage and strength, um, but also using resources. And, and this idea of self-respect, um, which for me always brings also uh, a respect for others and a desire to impact the world. Um, so in the simplest way, I like to think about leadership even today with this idea of a curious mind, a discovery approach, um, an idea of connecting with those around me and allowing others to thrive, but also with a, a bias towards action, a bias towards making incremental steps towards a goal. But when I think about leadership sort of in the business world and the business hat, the definition that stands out for me is, is actually one from the Oxford Dictionary. And it's that leadership is the ability of an individual or a group of individuals to influence and guide followers or other members of an affinity collective. And what I love about this is it takes away the idea of leadership as innate. It takes away the idea of leadership having specific character traits that um, maybe social structure might bias us towards. It even takes away the idea of leadership being an individual role. And instead, it looks at leadership in this collective way about taking action and providing guidance. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, I think the Girl Scouts can resonate with a lot of us on the call. Um, so I appreciate that connection. I'm also getting hungry between Girl Scouts <laughs> and cookies and crepes. <laughs> <laughs> the chat is definitely uh, gonna result in me doing something afterwards. It's a good snack. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I know you touched a little bit on this in, in your last question, but um, how would you describe your leadership style and how you lead others? Well, I appreciate being asked this question because this is something that I've struggled with in my professional career. And I think it's important for me to share that. I shared, uh, I've had a, a, a long career and one that by, by external measures um, has afforded me a lot of opportunity and has given me a lot of chances at leadership. And my leadership style has evolved. Um, I was a two-sport college athlete, and my early leadership style was, was really grounded in that combination of that take action element of the Girl Scouts approach and that experience on the field of, of having a plan and executing on a plan and taking my team um, with my own capacity. And so I used to lead from the front, and in doing that, I realized in retrospect that I was alienating a lot of team members, that I was discounting the ways in which other people might approach work in a different way that, than me, um, that actually could have resulted in perhaps a more efficient, a more innovative or more successful outcome. And so today my leadership style has evolved from sort of that lead from the front, um, fall on the sword, work long hours, model the behavior leadership style of my early career into what I call today an inclusive leadership style, 
that's really driven around this idea of empowering others to thrive, providing a safe to try work environment, giving people the opportunity and structuring the work in a way that people have the chance to contribute authentically and in their time and in the manner and channel that they want, but within the framework of a collective vision. Um, I feel that it's my responsibility as a leader within the different organizational hats I wear to provide a North Star, an idea of the company vision that we're trying to achieve, the compelling values the company stands by, um, but then standing back and allowing other people to operate in their thrive zone. Um, it's taught me a lot of vulnerability. And so today I lean more on that curiosity and discover element of that Girl Scout value trait than I did on the take action element. I do a lot less daily work and a lot more celebrating and learning from the success of team members. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll move ahead to the next one. Um, so to follow up on that, you talked about, you know, your personal style and convictions, but what do you think makes a great leader and which skills do you use most often in your leadership role? I, I don't believe in one element being a character trait that is the solve all for leadership. I think it's really important um, in this concept of inclusive leadership to continuously evaluate and reflect on the strengths of those around. So the observational skills of listening, the observational skills of creating space for others, of providing room for a team to collaborate, um, those are elements that I think are really critical to designing a safe, employee engaged employee work environment. And so this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is for me at the core of innovative leadership. It's at the core of inclusive leadership. Um, and it's not just around the elements of racial diversity or of uh, kind of behavioral diversity, but it's truly the different ways in which we work, looking at people who are experiment experimentation oriented versus people who are research and think driven. And so really observing and being able to identify the skills of the team and then helping those team members to lean into the areas that will empower them to feel and find success at work. Um, is what I work on the most myself. I think what makes a great leader, if I had to choose just one thing, is recognizing that a leader alone doesn't make for an enduring company. I work with a lot of, and I see the question on the screen, I'll repeat it back out, sorry about that. Um, what is one mistake you witness leaders making more frequently than others? Um, the desire to jump in, <laughs> the desire to help. And I find that this happens, um, per is particularly true with well-intentioned leaders um, and entrepreneurial leaders at the early stages of their companies as they begin to scale. Um, so I have the opportunity to work with both startups and what we would call uh, enterprise organizations. And I would say that the mistakes I see leadership making in those two environments are very different. In the startup organization, uh, there tends to be a leader at the center uh, dynamic that takes place. Their leader created the compelling vision. They gathered people around this vision for whatever problem the company is solving, for the audience that the company is going to be working with. They're able to create a collective energy around the organization and the company culture they're building. 
But in order to get to that next stage, that stage of scale within an organization, they need to start to distribute power. They need to start to lean in to team members independently solving and bubbling up new and innovative ways to solve the same problem. They need to disattach from the how that the problem gets solved and instead attach to who within their organization um, can help to drive and evolve the organization's future. And so as we think about those early stage founders, it's holding on too long to the leader at the center center business model, holding on too long to the idea that the leader um, has the only vision for the company, that the leader knows best the customers, that the leader best understands the problem. And instead, um, successful and thriving early stage leaders understand the value of bringing in others who help to disrupt even their own thoughts around the mission and the value. In contrast, when working with large enterprise organizations, um, I've observed leaders who distribute the, the vision of the company to their directors and executive levels, um, leaving a lot of the team in what I call the corporate game of telephone. Have any of you, and you can tell me with a thumbs up on the screen or in chat, have you ever, ever, any of you ever played the, the game Telephone? This is a game that might have been played in Girl Scouts, in fact. Um, I see a couple of thumbs ups. Um, the game of Telephone is a game where one person says a statement. They say, the vision for our organization is to be the leading company solving this problem. And they share it and they share, these are the four pillars that I believe will support it. And they share that with their executive level or in the game of telephone, it's one statement, you know, so-and-so walking their dog, their dog is named this. And then it goes down the line. And by the end, the person's walking a crocodile or the person's running a crocodile through a swamp or the person's bringing a crocodile uh, across a, a river. And it's so far from that original vision. It's still there, but it's it's lost in translation. And that's true in the game of telephone. And it's true very much in corporate America, where sometimes there becomes a disconnection between the, the strategic goals of the company. They're either hidden. Um, there's so many silos within the organization that individual directors, even well-meaning, even with the best of intentions at translating that vision, aren't bringing that compelling North Star to the team. And it leaves team members um, really disconnected from how the work they do day to day in their roles is contributing to the organizational success. And so on both ends of, of sort of the leadership mantra, I would say the the solve for both of these mistakes is to connect with and lean into your observational skills and also lean into a regular cadence of communication that can be trusted within your organization. So both listening and communicating on a regular basis with your entire team. Those are great pointers. Seems like the the common theme is just observing, listening, and communicating with your team. So thank you for sharing. We'll go ahead and jump into our next question, which is um, on that topic, where do the great ideas come from in your organization? And um, you touched on this a little bit, but how do you encourage creative thinking within your organization? So, I, I shared about the importance of observational skills, listening and leadership, um, but it's also important to do this in the marketplace for companies to stay attached to the competitive landscape. Um, when I'm hearing from founders who are seeking funding for the early stage startups, it's always a caution flag. If they say I'm the first to ever be solving this problem, um, there are no competitors. And so I would say one important recognition is that 
great ideas for how to run an organization come from both inside and outside the organization. They come from current clients. They come from canceled clients. They come from clients who never signed up. They come from every team member. They come internally from the team members that are doing the work um, that's related to the innovation or the idea. They come from the people who are going to be processing on the back end. Um, the partners who are the recipients of that work, and also the people who leave your organization. They come from the people who interview, who aren't hired. Um, really, when I think about uh, great ideas, it's important to recognize that they come from the ecosystem in which a company exists. And that ecosystem, to be truly enduring, should have that curious nature that we mentioned as a key element of of leadership. The ecosystem will provide a lot of insight, but great ideas within the company also come from creating a safe environment. I mentioned this kind of idea of safe to try. Um, at On Its Axis, we have a philosophy that we call fail forward. Um, probably to the disdain of some team members, <laughs> this is a very important element of, of our iterative approach to solving problems. We, we leave problems out in the air for the whole team to think about. We'll share out an assignment. We'll say, we would like to achieve this. And we spend some time giving team members the opportunity to ask why we want to achieve it, why that's the goal, to um, come up with innovative ways to approach how to collaborate on solving the problem. Um, Davina, who's here on the phone, um, and, and I can talk about times where she and I have been working together on something. And I have in my mind that um, we'll collaborate in a Google Doc. And she creates a template in Google Sheets. And at first, I'm totally puzzled. And I don't understand why. Um, but we'll create a dynamic where I'll ask, how did you choose Google Sheets over Google Docs to collaborate on this particular engagement. And I'll see that it's a different way of framing the problem that she's approaching um, that actually helps me think about it in a more holistic way. Uh, so the safe to try work environment is really about empowering team members, again, to operate in their thrive zone, but it's also allowing team members to operate sometimes in what we all call the stretch zone, that place of discomfort where we're outside of our natural approach to doing the work, where we're spending more time listening, observing, and we're trying to figure out um, how a team member is solving so that we can collectively innovate on a solution. Another way to call that is the karate kid method. Sometimes we don't know where we're going at the start of problem solving, um, but we find out together as a team and usually faster than if we took the approach of lead from the front. Great, thank you. Um, this is sort of similar to the last question, but you talked a little about comparing a startup versus is a larger company, but you know, as we think about an organization getting larger, um, you know, there's this this tendency for the institution to dampen the inspiration. How do you keep this from happening? I think this is such an important concept when we think about scale. When we think about an organization. Um, we often start to think about repeatable process or systems. We start to um, maybe the word bureaucracy might come up um, because we start to focus on risk management in a way that we don't at the earliest stages of startups. And, and that's an important part of running an enduring company at scale is having systems, is moving out of firefighting mode, is moving out of rapid innovation into uh, kind of a continuous improvement innovation mode. But it is important for organizations to be able to operate across the innovation horizons. By a show of hands, for those of you who are in the room, are you familiar with this idea of innovation horizons? Okay, a few of you. I'm going to spend just a minute um, just talking about innovation horizons. 
So as we think about enduring companies, one of the concepts is that companies move from what we'll call startup stage to what we would call mid-market stage to an enterprise organization. And this can be based on total customers, revenue, size, number of locations. There are a lot of different ways that the market measures the different stages a company is in. But oftentimes, um, associated with each of those stages is sort of a behavioral norm, an idea that a startup stage company is highly innovative, that they're operating in what we would call the disruptive innovation horizon or the transformational innovation horizon. The mid-market company we often think about as maybe solving for some disruptive innovation, uh, there are still people within the organization that are in that founder mentality that are still um, creating new and um, kind of transformational ideas for the organization, maybe thinking about new ways to serve existing customers or new ways to solve an entirely problem. But they're also beginning to think about what we call adjacent innovation, or innovation that is taking an existing solution and bringing it to a new market, taking an existing solution and serving a wider audience base, or maybe uh, innovating how they're serving their existing customer base. And then we think about these enterprise organizations and many of you can probably think of an enterprise organization that failed. Uh, earlier, I mentioned I've had the chance to work with some of the enduring Fortune 500 companies. The Fortune 500 list of enterprise organizations in its lifetime has cycled through many companies that weren't able to maintain their position as a leader in their industry space, in part because of this this idea that enterprise organizations move into what we would call the continuous improvement state or just serving an existing customer. In the chat, maybe those of you who are here, take a minute and think about a company that might fall into that stereotype in your mind, that enterprise organization that failed to serve. Maybe Blockbuster, maybe Blackberry, um, these are organizations that were market leaders that truly lost an opportunity by assuming that the way they were solving the problem would continue to be the way that the organization should serve. But this idea that each of those innovation horizons from that disruptive or transformational innovation all the way through to continuous improvement is associated with a company stage is a failing concept. And that's one way that we, when we're doing consulting work, help organizations to break the cycle of silos or institutional dampening of that innovation culture. Instead, we break it by breaking the myth that startups should be exclusively transformational and breaking the myth that enterprise organizations should largely focus just on maintaining existing revenue and, and kind of incremental revenue growth to that move the elephant uh, mentality and instead recognize that at every stage organizations should be building, developing, and empowering team members to work across those innovation horizons, to be able to make sure that even at the largest organizational side, you're empowering team to create a culture of disruptive or transformational innovation. That in that mid-market team, you're working on continuous improvement and you're working on your innovative and transformational and disruptive ideas. And even in startups, you're thinking about risk mitigation. You're thinking in a strategic way about how you will scale when you reach that next round of funding, when you reach that next customer milestone, how you'll do that in a repeatable customer-centric way. And that's how you keep it from happening at both the large and the small level is by embracing a culture of innovation horizons across the organization. Great, thank you. 
that was um, a really good um, way to think about inspiration um, and, and not dampening it in the organization and, you know, tying it back to Blockbuster and um, thinking about those organizations that have failed to keep up. So thank you. Um, I, you know, you brought bringing that back. I, I think it's important also, um, I failed to acknowledge something in that answer that's really fundamental to who I am, which is that products don't create successful companies. People do. And, and people and products together, um, you can have the best team, the smartest, most skilled, most capable team. But if they're solving for a product that doesn't have an attainable market, that doesn't have customer stickiness or desirability, they will struggle. Um, so people on both the internal and the customer side really determine company success. And so to keep inspiration alive, it's really to think about who you're serving and what problems are being solved and really think about that customer experience um, and then empower your teams to support and solve for that customer experience. And in doing so, you really will help to drive that culture of innovation. The other thing is that internal and external um, people aren't singular in nature. And so really embracing people as whole beings and embracing that career is just one aspect of your team's uh, total identity is really important aspect of creating that safe space for innovation. So really empowerment and um, acknowledgement of people within your team and acknowledgement of that customer experience is essential. Great, thank you. That's an important call out um, for this piece. Um, we'll move into the next question. Um, <clears throat> how do you rally the team to take on a big goal? You've talked a little bit about this, about product and people, but how do you really bring the team in and um, to take on that big goal? Coffee and food. No, just kidding. Um, so when I worked in corporate in M&A, um, when we wanted to rally, we would have um, something we would call uh, a town hall meeting or a summit. Um, and we would bring together the leaders of an organization. And I always felt something was missing in that because it would be this big weekend or week long strategy session with all of the VPs and all of the directors and all of the C-suite. Um, and we would brainstorm on a whiteboard or we would put sticky notes around a room or we would learn and figure out how we were gonna go back to the team to inspire them. But the gap was that the people who were frontline interacting with the customers those people were often left out of those conversations. They were often not included. And that always felt like a, a point of failure. And so today I would say I no longer rally from the front. Um, I really listen to the team for where the team energy is bubbling up. I listen for what what work are we working on that seems to be creating fatigue, that the deadlines keep getting pushed back? And how can I help support that? So bringing people together to talk about what's not working when I observe that something's slow within an organization. Um, creating a dynamic where the, the flow, the natural ebb and flow of how work gets done and the dynamic of how the team collaborates together to accomplish things is actually a great way to get the team to take on a big goal. The other element is really something I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, which is about helping people to understand how the work they do at every level of the organization is supporting those organizational pillars, those milestones that we as a leadership team have said are important to the company's success. So not my success as a leader, but the collective success that we're all working toward as an organization, which we all know. So being really clear about what are we marching toward as a team? Why did we choose those goals? Having the team be bought into those goals. 
and then helping to ensure that every member of the team, from our executive assistant to the person running payroll to the third party contractor that's helping with an element of our business in, in our data security, they all understand the business that we're running in our key objectives and they do it succinctly. And having the team understand how their work contributes to our ability to collectively shine, to collectively achieve milestones, to me is the best way to rally toward a big goal, plus food. Food is always good and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you know, that's um, it's very practical. Um, approach to taking on a big goal and I guess tying it back to the big picture, right? It's really important to understand how do your daily tasks tie back to that big goal. So I appreciate that. Um, we'll dive into the next question. How can organizations balance the tactical versus the strategic imperatives? I think this is one area that really depends on the growth stage and the milestone objectives that the company is at. I do believe that at different stages of an organization's development, there are different business model and energy priorities that should be taking place. So at the earliest stages of a new product launch, whether you're an enterprise company launching a new product or you're a startup, it's really important to have a strategic vision, but it's most important to have a testing and action plan that allows for product validation that is truly actionable and that is bite-sized um, to allow for that iterative, safe to try work environment that I talked about. Whereas as a mid-stage company, uh, you're at a very important growth point. It's very hard for an organization to go from zero to 100 employees, to go from 100,000 to $10 million in annual recurring revenue, ARR. These are milestones, but it's even harder to move from 10 to 1,000, from 10 million to 100 million. And it's really important at that mid-scale stage to start to put effort toward the business model and strategic imperatives, building out that pillar system, building out the collective team that is designed to help create that goal. So really thinking about where your organization is or where your product, if you're uh, an intrapreneur within a larger organization that you're responsible for a specific product, where your product is in a life cycle, um, and then determining that balance between tactical, actionable work and strategic and visionary work um, is really important. So really just tying it to where you are in your organizational growth. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, we're, we're, we're at, towards the end, so we'll do this one for the audience. What's one piece of advice you have for those currently in our audience uh, preparing for leadership roles um, or currently in a leadership role? Stay curious, um, continuously learn. I think that there are many people from my early career um, who would say I have no right to be giving this talk and they would have been right. I had no right in my early career um, in spite of being promoted several times and um, being given the role of leader within an organization. I certainly hadn't earned it. And my, my true leadership um, skills are really coming from learning to become vulnerable, learning to accept they don't have the answers, learning to accept that other people on the team will understand how to approach a problem in a way that's better than the way that I would approach it. Um, understanding where my strengths are for the organization and the limitations of those strengths and surrounding myself with people who are better for me was instrumental to my growth. And so if I could give you just one piece, 
of advice. Don't let an early mistake deter you from leadership. Create a safe to try work environment in your career. Surround yourself with people who will empower you with candid feedback, even if you don't want to hear it. And give yourself the ability to learn and grow as a leader. Don't give up, but also don't assume you have all of the answers. And don't always lead from the front. Sometimes you lead by listening. It's really great advice. Um, and it looks like we're towards the end of our structured question portion of this discussion. Um, so I would love to open it up to the audience, um, see if they had any questions for you that you can send it through chat. You can ask Kelly directly. You can DM any of us, Kel Kelly, Kayla, or I, myself, um, and we'd be more than happy to um, ensure. And we have one in chat, Kelly. Um, can you please share books that you, inspire you as a leader? This is such a, a great question. And um, one leadership element I didn't talk about is the continuous learning that I do personally through reading. Um, so books, audio books, um, when I'm running on the treadmill, I'll listen to a book sometimes. Um, when I'm on planes and I spent a lot of time in planes in my career, I would read a lot. Um, and so I really do believe that it's powerful to, to read. Um, there are a few books that moved me professionally um, and helped me learn. Um, one is, is one that was very early in my career um, and it was about change agility and it was who moved my cheese. Um, I'm somebody who grew up in a very disruptive early childhood environment. And as such, I really worked hard to structure and control my work environment. And I needed to release some of those skills, um, those defense skills I learned in my early, my early childhood in order to truly be a successful leader and to implement some of the things I'm talking to you about um, today in this talk. So Who Moved My Cheese um, is a fun uh, story of change agility. Um, Arlen Hamilton uh, just and this is um, the exact opposite. So most recently, <laughs> um, I read a book by Arlen Hamilton called It's About Damn Time. And this is a story of resilience, of uh, disruptive leadership, of the potential to change an in industry. Um, but it's also learning from one person's experience. Um, so those are two uh, books that sort of both ends of a spectrum. I very rarely do binaries, um, but they're great examples of, of kind of business, what I would call business books that have moved me. Um, additionally, I love reading creative nonfiction. Um, and I think that there's a lot of learning about leadership that can come from reading um, creative nonfiction and even fiction stories, learning about how teams work together, learning about how a writer envisions human identity and human connection and communication. Um, and so I often find myself reading uh, fiction books after work, and then it helps to open up my mind about something, a problem I'm working on in the real world. I'll put together a more comprehensive list and uh, share out on an upcoming Twitter. So I'm on Twitter at Kelly O'Cares. Um, so I think this is a great question. Those are just a couple that come top of mind. On the fiction side, I would say the, um, the series, The Dark Trilogy, um, and I'll pull that up because I can't think of the author. It was a really great book series. Uh, what is that book series? I'll have to write it because I can't think of it right now and I've got it wrong. So, but great question. That is a great question. I think I'll check out Who Moved My Cheese because it seems interesting. And if anyone wants to know the author, it's Spencer Johnson. Um, 
and yeah, it's on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, it's free audiobook. So be sure to listen to it. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask live, um, go for it. The, the book, the fictional book series I couldn't think of, but wanted to share is um, the Dark Materials series by Pullman. So um, really interesting series on humanity. Philip Pullman is the author. Any additional questions? Anybody want to talk about apple cider donuts again? I might be ordering from Uber Eats. Oh, this is a wonderful question. Can you be a leader with a non-alpha personality? I would say without a doubt, you absolutely can. Um, there's a, at the beginning of, uh, I'm going to repeat that question because it's a powerful one. Can you be a leader with a non-alpha personality? And my answer is an unequivocal yes, you absolutely can. Um, at the very beginning of our session today, I mentioned breaking some of the stereotypes of what a leader is. And um, we are given many images in fiction, in television, in uh, even business magazines and white papers on the role of leaders. Um, Statistics will say that CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are more commonly over six feet tall. Um, there are many stereotypes that lead people to pursuing a leadership path. And those are just um, what they are. There are stereotypes. There are invisible barriers that people that are outside of those stereotypes have to face in order to uh, advance as leaders, but leadership is not about being an alpha. It's not about driving people to a result or pulling people to an end. It's not about a hero falling on a sword. Leadership is truly about creating a collective response to a common problem that you're looking to solve. Um, I am an alpha introvert. So I'm somebody who has a tendency to jump in quick. I'm somebody who has a tendency to believe very confidently in my ability to solve problems. Um, but I am also an introvert. If I'm given a choice to read a book in a hammock or attend a networking event, I will choose the hammock and the book all day, every day. Um, that's not something you might expect from somebody who's speaking on a webinar about leadership. Um, but there are many, many, many ways to be a leader in the world. There are many, many ways to solve problems. Um, and so this alpha introvert says you can absolutely uh, lead by influence. Any other questions? I love these questions. So it's different and, and great. So um, keep asking. Hi, Kelly, I actually have a question. So being an exceptional leader yourself, do you currently have any uh, you know, goals for yourself, maybe in terms of like your leadership style or things that you wish to accomplish as a leader moving forward? Always. Um, so one, one aspect that I work on is giving myself grace. Um, I am very goal-driven. I am somebody who for a long time um, really required external validation for my own understanding of worth. And that external validation came from promotions, achieving milestones, um, receiving awards, uh, finishing a race in a personal best time. 
Um, and so my current goal is disattaching from that need for external validation um, and finding ways to inspire and to identify that I've inspired other people to thrive and other people to shine. And that's a really important aspect of my professional development right now is to be comfortable um, really leading others to success and achievement and taking time to allow myself to understand who I am outside of some of the constructs of what I believed success to look like. That's a very vulnerable answer, but that's the truth. We have two questions that came in through chat, Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. What are your favorite leader models or people? And then the other question is, can you be a leader without knowing how to follow? Mm. I have so many favorite leaders um, that that will be another commitment to this, to this audience that I will um, share in Twitter. Uh, people who've inspired me um, and different people who lead. Uh, and they're across the different aspects of my identity from social impact to business um, to athletics. Um, so I will say, I don't believe that there's any one right way to lead. Um, I do believe that the leaders I respect the most have a common trait, and that's that they inspire those around them, and they're doing it with an intention to the greater social good. And so that, for me, is a really important um, element to leadership that I look for in all of the people I find myself most inspired by. Can you be a leader without knowing how to follow? You can. I would ask this group, do you think you can be a good leader? without knowing how to follow. You can certainly be a leader. I've worked for many of them. I've probably even been a leader that didn't know how to follow. Um, so you certainly can be. Um, in fact, being a leader without knowing how to follow has historically been a way to get promoted <laughs> within organizations, particularly if you're results driven. Um, but I don't know that you can be a thriving leader creating an empowered team uh, without, without knowing how to listen, without understanding how to learn from others and without understanding how to observe and not just lead. Mm 